And now we go to Syria, where activists say forces loyal to Syrian President Bashar al-Assad have killed at least five children during the weekend fighting over the town of Nebek, north of the capital Damascus. And a warning, the photo that you're about to see is graphic. This image posted on social media shows what activists said were the bloody corpses of five children. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, a British-based pro-opposition monitoring group, said the children were shot dead when pro-Assad forces entered Nabak's industrial area. Now, news agencies have not yet been able to independently confirm the reports. Fighting in the area intensified last month when the government launched an offensive to secure towns along the road. More than 100,000 people have been killed in Syria's two and a half year old conflict. Well, joining us now is Dr. Rila Halam. She is a British Syrian doctor and war zone medic active in Syria. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, Dr. Halam. Thank you for having me. Um, okay, so, you know, we saw this horrendous um, image here and, it, you know, I, I, just to sort of show it again, it's, it's horrendous and killing is all too common. You yourself witnessed the aftermath of a fatal bomb attack on a school in Aleppo earlier this year. You know, what do you think this targeting, why do you think this targeting of children isn't sparking more international outrage? I'm wondering that myself, to be very honest. I mean, there's been such um, a disconnect, I think, from the public and from the international community on the atrocities that are happening in Syria. Um, Human Rights Watch, Save the Children, the United Nations agencies have time and time again um, talked about um, the targeting of schools, targeting um, um, of children, um, not just in terms of the violence, but sexual abuse um, and uh, they're in besieged areas where they don't have any access to food, to water. Um, millions of them are homeless in sub-zero temperatures like you've got here in New York and um, with nowhere to go and no international assistance. Um, I, think, I think part of the problem is the crisis becomes so huge these numbers have become so huge they've become meaningless to people. I mean right. when you say 13 million people are homeless what is what does that look like? Most people can't visualize how huge that is. Exactly. And if you say well that's like the, you know, New York, Los Angeles and Chicago, all homeless. Maybe people might start to sort of start to visualize what that might look like. And you know, it's kind of huge number. Continuing on with that visualization, really. I mean, you've been to Syria and you were last there, I know, in August. But yeah. give us a sense of like how the healthcare system is actually deteriorating. I mean, what sort of diseases are you seeing? What sort of supplies are you able to get to help fight off some of these horrendous diseases? I mean, we, we read about one, um, which you're going to have to pronounce for me. I, I, can't, I cannot pronounce it, but I mean, it's horrendous. Uh, Leishmaniasis, I yeah. believe it is, yeah. um, on the rise. And you, know, you can see some of the horrendous effects there. But what are the biggest challenges? just facing you okay I think um, few people realize that healthcare has been used as a weapon of war in Syria from the very beginning there's been targeted targeting of hospitals there's been targeting of doctors um, and so now we've got more than 70% of hospitals and medical facilities are um, destroyed and disused um, most of the doctors have fled the country um, so in Aleppo the biggest city and um, most populous in in Syria there used to be 5,000 doctors there's now 36 um, so you've, you've you've got that to, um, on the one hand and then on the other hand you've got um, um, poor um, uh, supplies that are arriving because the areas that are besieged so they're not able to access the, the medications um, so you've got poor supplies no doctors no hospitals and on the other hand you've also got the very basic ingredients to health are missing so when you've got no sanitation when you when you're like one of the camps I saw in Syria in August the the the, 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 the homeless people were drinking sewage water because that's the only source of water they had so then you've got infectious diseases so you've got typhoid that are spreading um, in the north North parts of the country and then you've got lack of immunizations so diseases like polio like measles that are eradicated in this country and had been eradicated in Syria are now starting to rear their ugly head um, so you're literally going backwards is what you're oh, saying we've basically. been catapulted to the dark ages to be very honest we've we used to have a very sophisticated healthcare system for for a developing nation um, and sadly now you, you'd struggle to find um, clean water and antibiotics it's, it's absolutely heartbreaking you know and one of the things that we've been reading about you know is a piece today about by Seymour Hersh and he had been talking about the falsification potentially by the Obama administration about exactly who was responsible for some of the sarin and the fact that the rebels and the, the Syrian rebels could potentially have had the wherewithal to create sarin gases themselves. It was something that wasn't really presented to us. I mean, you know, in terms of the biggest problems facing the Syrian kids, is it the bombings? Is it Bashar al-Assad? Is it the rebels? What are the biggest concerns for you and what are the next steps? 
Um, the biggest problem is, is the fact that the ongoing violence is not only targeting kids, but is, is, is stopping all of the humanitarian and medical assistance from reaching the children. So I think it's a, it's a two-pronged problem and it's all going back to the, the fact that there is ongoing violence. Um, the bloodshed needs to stop, but, but alongside that, there needs to be an emphasis on the humanitarian catastrophe. Um, you know, I think there's been, you know, the, the chemical weapons issue came and, and, um, and although it dealt with that, it actually really detracted away from the real problem, which is that you've got um, um, millions of people in abject poverty who are in need of immediate assistance, um, and that is not being delivered. Why can't we have a United Nations binding resolution um, that allows immediate access, uh, humanitarian access, cross borders and cross conflict lines like we've done with the chemical weapons. I mean, you've got United Nations personnel who are in Syria dealing in safety with the chemical weapons issue, but we haven't got aid workers, we haven't got doctors because they're being targeted and attacked. Yeah. Why can't we put the same emphasis on the humanitarian and medical issues as we have done on the chemical weapons? Again, um, I mean, that's the more difficult issue, right? That's the problem because that means actually doing something in terms of clout, in terms of things on the ground, uh, as opposed to just kind of like the facade of, you know, making, making statements. Yeah, the rhetoric. The rhetoric. And, yeah. Well, listen, Dr. Han, thank you so much for like joining us today and kind of detailing this. It's like, you know, really sad stuff, but, you know, good luck on your endeavors in Washington.